Good evening, everyone. It's good to see you here. Probably several of you have been to previous debates between Dr. Brown and uh, Rabbi Boteach. Uh, this is a long series, really, of uh, debates, such as the topic of Is Jesus the Messiah? to uh, who really killed Jesus in response to Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, and then most recently, the impact of Dan Brown's best-selling book, The Da Vinci Code. And so we're uh, very pleased once again to be here, um, challenged to moderate always, because we have two lively debaters who love to go at it with one another. But these two are no strangers to one another. In fact, over the years, they will tell you that they've become friends who share a common goal in these debates. And that goal is meaningful dialogue. And so let me read for you what they've written to me in the past when we've prepared previous debates. Rabbi Boteach once said, my people and my Judaism mean absolutely everything to me. I have agreed to these debates because I think they are profoundly important. They are about the possibility of Jews and Christians after two millennia of tension reaching out to each other as brothers. And Dr. Brown once said to me, I also believe that we can clearly underscore differences without the slightest hint of venom or ugliness and that some ground really can be gained for all parties involved. Our dialogue time will model a constructive way for Jews and Christians to approach these controversial issues, emphasizing our common ground and goals as well. So I'm convinced that uh, both of these men still feel the same way. So this is about education. This is about opening up our minds and hearts to consider the things perhaps we've never considered before. Now, tonight's topic is, did Jesus die for our sins, with a special emphasis on whether or not he should be identified as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. It is extremely controversial, and it has been for hundreds of years. Now, we thank this uh, Ethical Cultural Center for allowing the event to take place here and Chosen People Ministries and Congregation Jahar Adonai for sponsoring it and we thank you for coming. You will hear some of the very best arguments related to the topic both pro and con. You will witness spirited debate and we trust that proper decorum will prevail both on stage and in the audience. My wife and I raise two boys, very energetic very competitive boys. And deb debates around our house often escalated into fisticuffs. We could have used a good dose of shalom in the home, not to mention more ethical culture. And one of the Mother Goose nursery rhymes that we frequently read to our boys, I'm going to read to you right now, there were once two cats of Kilkenny. Each thought there was one cat too many. So they fought and they fit and they scratched and they bit it till accepting their nails and the tips of their tails instead of two cats there weren't any. Well, I feel confident that we will still have two cats completely intact by the end of our time tonight. And that time will be at uh, 845 sharp due to some contra contractual agreements and so I want to let you know that those cards that you fill out will be collected during the last round of speaking which will be five minutes each for each of the speakers and we will have you pass them to the outside so that we can collect them very easily and, and then we will uh, be asking those questions for, the, for our speakers to respond. And now I get to introduce each of them to you. First of all, Michael Brown, founder and president of Fire School of Ministry in Concord, North Carolina, visiting professor of Jewish apologetics at Fuller Theological Seminary, School of World Mission in Pasadena, California as well as visiting professor of Old Testament and Hebrew Studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School or Trinity International University now. He has a BA in Hebrew from Queens College and the MA and PhD in Near Eastern Languages and Literature from New York University. He's listed in the first edition of Who's Who in Biblical Studies and Archaeology. He's written 18 books including Our Hands Are Stained with Blood, The Tragic Story of the Church and the Jewish People in 12 Languages, the highly acclaimed multi-volume a work called Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. I have a copy here. You'll want to check that out as you leave. He's also uh, com written a commentary on Jeremiah for the new edition of the Expositor's Bible Commentary. He's a contributor to the Oxford Dictionary of Jewish Religion, the Theological Dictionary of the Old Testament, and the International Dictionary of Old Testament Theology and Exegesis, and the Semitic Linguistic Journals Ma'arav and Ugarit Forshungen. 
popular church and conference speaker. Mike Brown has preached throughout America and on more than 100 trips outside of the United States to a total of 25 nations, challenging the religious system and calling for spiritual, moral, and cultural revolution. Hot Off the Press is a 22-hour DVD series called Countering the Counter Missionaries by Dr. Michael Brown. This, might be a, this will be available in the back as well. Now to uh, Rabbi Shmuley Boteak, host of uh, the Living Channel's critically acclaimed TV show Shalom in the Home, airing every Monday night at 10 still? I'm not sure exactly when, but we watch it all the time. I'll give, I'll, I'll give a great plug as soon as I get to the podium. You know, I'm not surprised that you would do that. Here's the book that has just come out concerning the show, so please uh, avail yourself of that. Another book that he has written most recently, I believe, is 10 Conversations You Need to Have with Your Children. So that's another one out of many that are available back in the back. Uh, he's a national syndicated talk show host, international best-selling author of 14 books, the first non-Christian to be named winner of the London Times Preacher of the Year Award in 1999 with a record number of points earned in the competition. He founded the Oxford University L'Chaim Society, beginning or becoming the second largest student organization ever founded at Oxford within three years and served as a rabbi to the students for 11 years. He's been the subject of the BBC documentary called The Moses of Oxford. He has interviewed and or debated such personalities as, as uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, Shimon Peres, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, Elie Wiesel, Yitzhak Shamir, Michael Jackson, uh, Simon Weisenthal, Stephen, yes, Michael Jackson, Stephen Hawking, <laughs> Javier Perez de Cuellar, Deepak Chopra, and Richard Dawkins, among others. He's also written Kosher Ch uh, Sex, Kosher Adultery, Dating Secrets of the Ten Commandments, Why I Can't Fall in Love, The Private Adam, that is Becoming a Hero in a Selfish Age, Judaism for Everyone, The Private Adam, uh, I already said that. Several of his books have been translated into 17 languages, and most recently, The Ten Conversations You Need to Have with Your Children. I mentioned. He's appeared on the Today Show, The View, Hannity and Combs, and Good Morning America, and he's been profiled in publications such as Time Magazine, Newsweek, The London Times, and New York Times, LA Times. I think most importantly, uh, he is said to be by Newsweek the most famous rabbi in America. Married to Debbie with eight children. Here's the format, very briefly. Each man will speak for 15 minutes, and then each man will speak for 10 minutes. Then each man will speak for five minutes. You can see where we're going. After that five-minute segment, we'll be taking your cards, and we will be reading those questions. So please be sure that you indicate to which speaker you would like the question addressed. Uh, during the question and answer, there will be two minutes for a response to the question, and then a one-minute rebuttal available to the other speaker if he so desires. And then there will be a final closing uh, couple of minutes uh, for each of the speakers. And so, without further ado, thank you again for coming. And our first speaker this evening is Dr. Michael Brown. It's, it's great to be with all of you. I appreciate you coming very much. And it's great to be here with my dear friend Shmuley. We're actually both so busy that the only way we can get together and have a meal is to schedule a debate. So I look forward to spending the night with you later. And it's great to have a debate focused on the question, did Jesus die for our sins? And, and does Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, speak of him? I've agreed with Shmuley to do debates on other subjects, God willing, in the future, like the question of the incarnation or even issues relating to heaven and hell. Happy to debate on those. But tonight we're going to focus on this issue. Did Jesus die for our sins? Does Isaiah 53 speak of him? Now, I want to clarify something first. When I say that Jesus, Yeshua, died for our sins, that does not mean that his death absolves us of personal responsibility. What it means is this. His death takes the place of the atoning temple sacrifices. His death is the perfect guilt offering. His death fulfills the intercessory role of Israel's high priest. His death is the ultimate example of what rabbinic literature speaks of as the atoning power of the death of the righteous. And when we couple his death on the cross for our behalf with faith and repentance, our sins will be forgiven and we'll receive empowerment to live a holy life before God. Now, I want to explain something. Some of you may not be completely familiar with a few of the Jewish concepts I just made reference to. So I want to read a quote to you from a highly respected Orthodox rabbi and historian, Beryl Wine, from his book, Triumph of Survival. This is an Orthodox rabbi. 
He's speaking of how Jews cope with suffering through the generations. He said, another consideration tinged the Jewish response to the slaughter of its people. It was an old tradition dating back to biblical times that the death of the righteous and innocent served as an expiation for the sins of the nation or the world. The stories of Isaac and of Nadav and Avihu, the prophetic description of Israel as the long-suffering servant of the Lord, the sacrificial service in the temple, all served to reinforce this basic concept of the death of the righteous as an atonement for the sins of other men. Jews nurtured this classic idea of death as an atonement, and this attitude towards their own tragedies was their constant companion throughout their turbulent exile. Therefore, the holy bleak picture of unreasoning slaughter was somewhat relieved by the fact that the innocent did not die in vain and that the betterment of Israel and humankind somehow was advanced by their stretching their neck to be slaughtered. The spirit of the Jews is truly reflected in the historical chronicle of the time called Yevon Mitzulah. Would the Holy One, blessed be He, dispense judgment without justice? But we may say that he whom God loves will be chastised, for since the day the holy temple was destroyed, the righteous are seized by death for the iniquities of the generation. Now look, this is an orthodox rabbi writing. And I want you to notice he compares, quote, the prophetic description of Israel as the long-suffering servant of the Lord with the sacrificial service in the temple, saying that both of them serve to reinforce this basic concept of the death of the righteous as an atonement for the sins of other men. So he's saying that Isaiah 53 applies to Israel as the suffering servant of the Lord and that the deaths of the Jewish people through the ages, specifically the righteous and the innocent, according to this rabbi, quote, served as an expiation for the sins of the nation or the world. So we just need to fine tune his position to say this. It's not Israel as a nation that dies for the sins of the world, according to Isaiah 53. It is the Messiah, the ideal representative of Israel, who dies for the sins of the nation and the world, according to Isaiah 53. I'm going to make five main points having to do with Isaiah 53. I'll make reference to lots of scriptures. You won't be able to look them all up now, but write them down or get the DVD. I'm going to be textual. I'm going to be specific. I'm not going to try to push emotional buttons. I want to look at what the text says. You're thinking people. I want to give you something to think about. Number one, context is everything. Context is everything. If you go through Isaiah chapters 40 to 51, you'll see that the Hebrew word eved, which is servant, the servant of the Lord, is mentioned 17 times from Isaiah 40 to 51. Sometimes with reference to the nation of Israel as a whole, like Isaiah 41, 8 and 9 and Isaiah 42, 19. Sometimes with reference to a righteous individual within the nation, like Isaiah 49, 3 and Isaiah 50, 10. And in several verses, it's debated whether it's the nation as a whole or an individual being spoken of, or you can make a good case for an individual like Isaiah 42.1. But here's what's so fascinating. The references to the servant in any plural sense, the references to the servant as a nation stop in Isaiah 48.20. And from there on, the servant is always and only an individual. Study it out for yourself. So by the time you reach Isaiah 52, 13, which is really the beginning of the Isaiah 53 passage, the focus is clear. It's speaking of a righteous individual within the nation. It's also important to notice that many of the prophecies of redemption in the scripture have as their backdrop Israel, the Jewish people coming out of exile in Babylon. Passages like Jeremiah 23, 1 through 8, Jeremiah chapters 30 to 33, Ezekiel chapter 36, they all speak of redemption coming on the heels of the Jewish people coming out of exile in Babylon. That's the same context here. And there's a, a little rabbinic saying, Vahamaskil Yavin, that the wise will understand, the word to the wise is sufficient. Check in Isaiah chapter 52, verses 11 and 12. The words go out from the midst, and the words you will not leave in haste. You'll find there are specific words that also occur in, in, in Exodus 12 and Deuteronomy 16 with reference to the Passover. This will be a better Exodus than the first Exodus, even pointing to the suffering servant as the Lamb of God. So to repeat, according to the larger context of Isaiah, Chapter 53 clearly refers to a person, not the nation. This is major. Number two, 
The mission of the servant is to bring Israel back to God, although it would seem initially that he failed in that mission, and to be a light to the nation. It would take endurance, and he would definitely suffer along the way. This is according to what's written in Isaiah leading up to Isaiah 53. According to Isaiah chapter 42, the servant is obedient and righteous, setting captives free. And according to the Targum, the Aramaic paraphrase of the scripture, and some of the leading rabbinic commentators, Isaiah 42.1 speaks of the Messiah, and that verse in the following verses. What does it say about him? I'll put my spirit on him. He'll bring justice to the nations. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. And then it says that he will be a light for the nations, for the Goyim, for the Gentiles. Who is this speaking about? And then Isaiah, the 49th chapter, the servant is called Israel and yet has a mission to regather Israel and Jacob and bring them back to God. And the servant is discouraged because he looks like he failed in his mission. And God says to him in Isaiah 49, don't be discouraged. Not only will you regather Israel, but you'll also be a light for the nations. I wonder who this is speaking about. Before we ever reach Isaiah 53, it's clear that the servant is not Israel in its entirety. Rather, he sent out a mission to restore Israel. And not only does he have a mission to Israel that looks initially like it fails, he has a mission to the nations. I'm just reading what the text says. Remember, context. Let's read what the scriptures say. We've all been raised with different traditions and opinions. Let's go back to what the scriptures say. Number three, just following what's written. The servant will experience great godlike exaltation, but it will be preceded by severe suffering. The servant of the Lord will die and then rise from the dead. So already in Isaiah 50, it says this about the servant of the Lord. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears, and I've not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. But then in 52.13, which begins the passage we're focusing on tonight, it speaks of him being highly exalted. In fact, the only other one spoken of in such terms in the book of Isaiah is God himself. Ram Benisa, high and exalted. Uh, according to the, the, the Midrash, she's going to be higher than Abraham, higher than Moses, higher than the ministering angels. But first, he'd be marred and mauled, so he didn't even look like a human being. I mean, who is this speaking about? Then Isaiah 53. This is what it says. You can read the whole text carefully when you get home, if you're not familiar with it. I'm just giving one verse after another. Isaiah 53 speaks of him being smitten and afflicted, Wounded, crushed, bruised. It says he was like a sheep being led to slaughter. It says he was cut off from the land of the living. The text also speaks of his grave and his death. In fact, the Hebrew for death is plural, which is a, a way within the Hebrew scriptures and Semitic languages of speaking of an especially violent death. The text speaks of him pouring out his soul to death. It states he made himself a guilt offering. And then the text explicitly states that he'll prolong his days in CC and that the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. How does this happen? How do you die a violent death and yet prolong your days? The answer is resurrection. That's how he suffers miserably and brutally, and yet he is highly exalted in the end. So we have a singular servant who represents Israel and carries a mission to Israel, one that seems to have failed, but he's also called to be a light to the nations, one who'll suffer a violent death before rising from the dead and seeing his spiritual seed live on, and in the end, he'll be highly exalted. I'd say the picture's getting pretty clear. But one of my friends, after he became a believer in Jesus, brought, brought home to his father the Bible that he got when he was bar mitzvah, and his father started reading Isaiah 53 and threw it down and said, somebody changed it. Why? Because it looked like it was speaking of Yeshua. So clearly, it is. Number four. Isaiah 53 clearly points to vicarious suffering, substitutionary suffering, specifically the servant's substitutionary death functioning as an asham, a guilt offering. So I'm going to just quote to you verses again from Isaiah 53. Sorry to quote so much from the Bible when we're talking about Scripture. <clears throat> Surely he took up our infirmities. Remember, he died in our place. He suffered on our behalf. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of all of us. 
He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. He made himself an offering for guilt and asham. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. He poured out his life to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The servant's death is in asham, which was specifically an offering for guilt, even for intentional sins in the Hebrew Bible. Listen, listen to some rabbinic concepts. Leviticus Rabbah 2012, Rabbi Chiyabar Abba said, the sons of Aaron died the first day of Nisan. Why then does the Torah mention their death in conjunction with the Day of Atonement? It is to teach that just as the Day of Atonement atones, so also the death of the righteous atones. That's why some famous rabbis, even in the Holocaust, cried out as they were dying, let me be an atonement for Israel. That's why the, the scriptures even point to this, and the Talmud confirms it, that the death of the high priest atones for certain sins. That's why it says in 1 Peter 3.18, written by a Jewish man, the New Testament, a Jewish book, the Messiah died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to God. Number five, last point. This is the message of Isaiah 53. We, the people of Israel, didn't realize that he... Our Messiah was dying for us. We thought he was dying for his own sins. Listen again to these words. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. We esteemed him not. That's been our history as Jews. We didn't recognize why he died. Surely he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. So, so I ask you, who is this speaking of? Who fits the bill in Jewish history? Who is the servant of the Lord who would be highly exalted, but only after suffering disfigurement and death? Who is the servant who would be rejected by his own people Israel, becoming a light to the nations, only to be recognized by his people in the end? Who is the servant who died a criminal's death and yet rose from the dead? Who is the servant of whom the prophet could declare he was wounded for our transgressions? Now, you'll hear a lot of objections, I'm sure, as to why they can't apply to Jesus. Honestly, some of the objections remind me of the OJ trial when the lawyers were trying to say that the DNA that matched him was planted by somebody. I mean, some of the objections are that flimsy. But there are solid answers for every one of those objections that can be raised. It has to be Jesus. It has to be Yeshua. He's the one that fulfills what's written in Isaiah 53. And I want to make a personal appeal to my dear friend Shmuley, since it's been a while since we've seen each other. You have 25 minutes to speak before your final comments. If you think you have a smoking gun, if you think you have a big objection, don't save it for the last five minutes when I can't rebut. Raise it and let's put it on the table like I put this on the table. Thank you. Rabbi Boteak. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am not in as good a mood as I otherwise would be on such an august occasion, where in a tabloid-centered society, we can discuss issues of such dramatic, historic, and spiritual import. I attribute my own malaise to my own actions. You see, just before arriving today back from Toronto, where I debated Richard Dawkins, the world's most famous atheist and the world's best known evolutionary biologist, we debated yesterday in Toronto, I had an argument with a very special soul. She's here in the audience tonight. I had a fight with my own wife. She's the mother of my eight children. She has been my bride since I was 21 years old and she was 19. But sometimes the pressures that bend me out of shape, that afflict and torment my soul, will cause me to act in a manner which is unbecoming, 
to speak in a way that is not righteous. And before I started this debate, since I did not see her until moments before the debate began, I just returned back. I had to go and I had to apologize to her. I had to say I was sorry for the hurtful things that I said to such a beautiful, special soul. Because nobody died for my sins. Because I am accountable for my own actions. Because the good that I do, I can take pride in. And the bad that I do, I take shame in. I am a member of a tiny, tiny people. But we have bequeathed to the world the single most powerful idea in the history of the world, which is that man created in the image of God is free, just like God. Freedom of choice, freedom of conscience, the ability to choose your own destiny, the ability to become the man you want to be and to avoid being the woman you don't want to be. That is the single most potent idea in the history of the world. And it has been an idea for which my people have faced torment, persecution. Antisemitism and forced conversion. Whether it was an evolutionary biologist who told me yesterday that we are all controlled by biological predeterminism genetic predisposition or whether it's my dear friend Mike Brown who wants to tell you tonight that Jesus died for your sins my friends you must rise to the occasion of right of transcending a message that says that you are not accountable for what you did wrong and that you must not repent of the sins that have blighted your soul the Bible makes it clear Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20 the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. There are no sacrificial lambs that can cleanse you of your sin. I'm sorry, you must do it yourself. It is the single most important message of the television show that I host, Shalom in the Home, that how you raise your children will come precisely down to the actions that you practice which are copied and ate by your kids. And isn't it true that all my Christian brothers and sisters who are here tonight believe in the very same thing? Because is that not the ethos of the great United States of America? We're not communists. We don't allow the state to take control or responsibility for our lives. God Almighty, even if it were true that Jesus died for your sins, then I would reject religion outright, and I would dismiss it as a farce. Because anything that robs me of my potential to be an individual and my accountability for my actions is another form of state control. And I choose not to live in Moscow, but in the United States of America. And it's the reason why that I, I call upon my Christian brothers and sisters to have your Christianity tonight enriched by the religion of Jesus of Nazareth, who was a devout Jew, a Pharisee, a rabbi, and everything he taught came straight from the Torah. And he never taught that he would die for anyone's sins. His message was one of empowerment, not disempowerment. You need to hear from the Jews how your faith can be enriched, not by trying to convert us, but by reaching out to us to understand the Jewishness of Jesus. Again, the Bible says, Numbers chapter 35, verse 31, do not accept a ransom for the life of a murderer who deserves to die. There is no ransom. He must surely be put to death. Personal accountability. Numbers chapter 35, verse 33, do not pollute the land where you are. Bloodshed pollutes the land. And atonement cannot be made. For the land on which blood has been shed, sadly, except by the blood of the one who shed it. Isaiah 53, 
has always been understood by the Jews to refer to the nation of Israel. That is not my opinion. It is, my, it is the opinion of one of the earliest church fathers. In the, year, in the third century of the Common Era, the Greek church father Origen wrote in Contra Celsum that Isaiah 53, according to the Jewish people, refers to the suffering of the children of Israel. We are God's suffering servant. It's the reason why that Isaiah 53 constantly changes tenses. There is the past, present, and future within one chapter. It speaks about three different tenses occurring to a single subject. If it were any man or any woman, it would not make sense. But if it refers to an eternal nation who have been the scapegoat of the nations of the world because they have paid the ultimate price for propagating a message of divine ethics and moral virtue, then it makes perfect sense. What we know is that Isaiah 53 cannot in any way refer to Jesus. For many reasons, it would take too long to go through them all. For example, it says that, quote, Isaiah 53 verse 3, he was despised and isolated from men, a man of pains and accustomed to illness. As one from whom we would hide our faces, he was despised and we had no regard for him. But if you open the New Testament, to the book of Matthew, chapter 4. Let me, let me actually begin with Matthew chapter, there's, there's many. Chapter 4, verse 25. And great crowds followed Jesus. They followed him from the Galilee, from the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. And again, in Matthew chapter 21, Verse 5, Jesus says, go and tell the people as he makes his triumphant entry into Jerusalem that their king is coming to see them. And who came to greet him? Chapter, verse 8, a very large crowd even spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him followed shouting, Hosanna, glory to the son of David. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. The New Testament says that Jesus was loved by the people, far from being despised. The same thing is said in the book of Luke, but you'll have to for forgive me due to time constraints, not being able to quote everything. It also says that whoever the suffering servant was, God desired to oppress him, verse 10, and he afflicted him. According to very learned scholars that, that, like Dr. Michael Brown, because we debated this in our debate about who killed Jesus, Jesus was never oppressed by God. He chose to lay down his life for the atonement of sin. It was not God's plan, it was his plan. But most importantly, it says that, quote, whoever is in Isaiah 53, like a sheep being led to the slaughter, or a ewe that is silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. We're all very familiar with what Jesus said on the cross as he died. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. He is, Jesus is slowly dying on the cross after being crucified. And then about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, with a loud voice, Keli, Keli, lama zabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Whoever is being discussed in Isaiah 53, it is impossible that it relates the death of Jesus. My friends, Isaiah 53 has always been understood by the Jewish people as referring to God's most long-suffering servant, a godly nation whose only crime was to bear witness to God in history. A nation that, as Isaiah says, has been regarded as, quote, diseased, stricken by God, afflicted, wasn't it the Christians that always said about us Jews that we were afflicted by God for having killed Christ? For having forsaken our Messiah? Is that not the reason that I'm here tonight to defend my faith against yet another challenge? Against yet another assault? At least now we can do it voluntarily. Once upon a time, we were forced into these debates at the blade, the sharp blade of a sword. Through his wounds, we were healed through the terrible suffering of the Jewish people, 
the nations of the world finally came to understand ethics and morality as they too embraced the Ten Commandments. We have all strayed like sheep, and each of us turning his own way, but God had inflicted upon him the iniquity of us all. We have the capacity to enter into a new era with our Christian brothers and sisters where the affliction, the persecution of the Jewish people will finally be put right to the godly lives of our Christian brothers and sisters, especially our evangelical brothers and sisters who are Israel's greatest supporters today. It will not come by continuing to make this prophecy true, by, ha by us hemorrhaging some of our best and our brightest, like Dr. Michael Brown, who indeed is one of my dearest friends, a, a man I confide in even about personal issues, but we lost him to our nation because he felt that he had no place in our community. That, and when he went to Christians saying, I'm lost, you know what they should have done? They should have sent him back to his people. They should have said, you are from the nation of Jesus. You must live the life that he lived. You must go to synagogue, put on tzitzis, put on tefillin, keep kosher. And you must find God through his tradition. That's what I've always done with all the wayward Christians who came to me and said that they found their religion vacuous and they wanted to become Jewish. Isaiah 53 is also an important homily to all of us who suffer for doing that which is right. If you read the verses, it fits perfectly with Abraham Lincoln, the greatest of our presidents, who indeed was despised, detested, called an orangutan, not by the South, but by the North. And he paid the price of other people's sins. Because when we took our African-American brothers and sisters and treated them like cattle and drew their blood with a lash, and when we sold their children on the block, that man paid the price with a bullet to his head. And indeed, he went to his death like a sheep that never opens his mouth, just like Martin Luther King did, because the chapter applies to him as well. To all of us who are prepared to suffer for that which is righteous, for those of us who are prepared to live like Moses, who the great Rav Moshe Alshech says, this applies to, this chapter, who dies forlorn and alone atop a mountain named Nebo, where there are none to bury him, and there are no 21 gun salutes, and there is no equestrian stature or Hollywood epic that is erected to his honor. He did the right because it was right. There was no reward. There was no glory. He did the right because it was right. And then like silent footsteps in the night, he retreated from the world stage and we are inspired by his memory till today. And one of those Jews who gave his life for his community was Jesus of Nazareth, who fought the Roman oppression. He hated Roman brutality. He lived for the Torah. He dressed exactly like me, albeit without a suit and perhaps with a tunic. But he was an Orthodox Jew who loved his people and when he tried to stop the Roman brutality, they killed him in cold blood, and he became one of the great martyrs of his people. And he joined the millions upon millions of Jews who have suffered for their faith, all of whom have been eternally memorialized by Isaiah 53. Thank you very much. All right, let me just uh, raise this up here. Okay, well, I appreciate that, Shmuley, and I'm always moved by your comments. And uh, I also had an argument with a woman today, too. It's the lady at the front desk of the hotel who lied to me about my dry cleaning being ready, and I had to apologize to her as well. <clears throat> okay, where to start? We just found out that Isaiah 53 applies to Abe Lincoln, the people of Israel, Martin Luther King, anybody who suffers, but not Jesus. Very interesting. Uh, also, somehow I remember saying at my opening comments that the fact that Jesus died for our sins does not remove accountability, 
And according to the scriptures, it must be joined with repentance. In fact, read through the New Testament, just study the word repent, repentance, read through the New Testament, you will find far more references to the New Testament word repentance than you will find to the word repentance in all the Torah. What's the issue? The issue is we all fall short, we all need mercy. I'll take all the help I can get. I'm going to repent and turn to God, but I'm not going to stand before God and say, look at how good and righteous I am, because we all fall short. You know why God has not destroyed the earth again since Noah's day? Because we fall short as a human race, and God would have to keep destroying it, according to Genesis, the eighth chapter. So there were temple sacrifices, there was the day of atonement, and the rabbinic traditions, even speaking of the atoning power, the death of the righteous, there are even rabbinic traditions that say that we pray, we should remember the sacrifice of Isaac on our behalf, so God will have mercy. Mercy. What, what about Ezekiel 18, 20, the soul that sins shall die? True. The New Testament says you reap what you sow. No argument there. But actually the context of that is people were saying that, that the father's sin and the, the son suffer for it. And the prophet was saying, no, everybody is going to die for his own sin. That remains the same. If we die in our sin without repentance, we're lost. If we repent and receive God's mercy, we can have forgiveness. And again, repentance is an essential foundational truth of the New Testament writings. Jesus begins his message in Mark 1.15. The time has come, repent and believe the good news. Paul says in Acts 17.30, God commands all men everywhere to repent. He says the message he preached for years, Acts 20.21, 20, was what? Repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus. The two go hand in hand. But even the concept of, of the merits of the fathers and, and, and the righteous in past generations helping the next generations, these are all saying that, that we need one another. We need the atoning sacrifice of the Messiah so that God, instead of punishing us, will punish him. So when we join that with our repentance towards God, he will say, I forgive you. The idea that Jesus never taught that he was going to die for our sins is... Uh, where do I start? I mean, how many verses do I quote? I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The son of man didn't come to serve, but to serve, uh, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for everybody. The Greek word lutron is the equivalent of the Hebrew word kofar, ransom. You know, Yom Kippur, atonement, day of atonement, the same word there. He said, I came to give my life as a ransom. His own words, over and over and over. And I was fascinated by the quotations from Numbers 35, here's the context. Someone accidentally kills another person, so there's bloodshed, okay? There's a problem. There's been bloodshed. You say, well, I'll repent, I'll ask forgiveness. Well, the only thing that will cleanse the blood is the blood of the person that killed the person. So what did Israel have? Israel had a city of refuge, according to Numbers 35. And you would go there if you accidentally killed someone, and you'd have to stay there the rest of your life or until the death of the high priest. Let me read the exact quote to you. The Talmud asked the question in Makot 11b, also Leviticus Rabbah 10.6, isn't it the exile of the innocent manslayer in the city of refuge that atones? The answer is no. It is not the exile that atones, but the death of the high priest. You had to stay in the city until either you died or the high priest died because he was the intercessor for the nation. And the Jewish scholar Jacob Milgrom comments, as the high priest atones for Israel's sins through his ritual service in his lifetime, so he atones for a homicide through his death. So the very text that Shmuley quoted from Numbers 35 is one that the Talmud uses to say that the death of the high priest atones. Amazing. Also, the notion that Isaiah 53 has always referred to Israel in rabbinic literature is untrue. Origen makes reference to interpretations in his day, but there's never been a day when every single Jew had the same interpretation of the scripture, and we know that the Talmud and the rabbinic writings make reference to uh, Isaiah 53 speaking of Moses, or Isaiah spe 53 speaking of the righteous, or Isaiah 53 speaking of other figures. So it was used with reference to other figures in the history of interpretation. Even most recently, the Babacher Jews applied it to, to their own Rebbe and said that Isaiah 53 applied to him. So it's never been universally and always applied to the people of Israel, even though that's been a dominant interpretation. But it can't refer to the people of Israel for a number of reasons. Number one, God made a covenant in the Torah, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, that if our people were righteous, then we would be exalted and blessed and be the head and not the tail. And if we sinned, that we would be punished. So as a nation, we could not be punished for the sins of others and suffer for the sins of others. Otherwise, God would have to break his own covenant, his own Torah. 
It can't refer to Israel. Also, it speaks of someone that was perfectly righteous and never sinned. That doesn't apply to Israel. Shmuley said through Israel's sufferings, the nations have been helped and, and learned about the Ten Commandments. Primarily, the nations have learned about the Ten Commandments through Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, who brought the knowledge of the God of Israel to the ends of the earth. And that's how these people around the world read the Hebrew Scriptures. That's how most Christians here know about the Ten Commandments. It's the same around the world. But there's a principle, according to Jeremiah 30, 11, that God would completely destroy nations that caused his people to suffer. So Israel's suffering was not good for the Babylonians. It was not good for the Assyrians. These people that afflicted Israel, it was not good for them. Have you ran into any Babylonians or Assyrians lately? And are you going to tell me that the Holocaust brought healing to Germany or the German people? Certainly not. So this idea that Israel's suffering has brought healing doesn't work. But the idea that Messiah's suffering has brought healing. So many here could say your lives were transformed when you put your trust in what God graciously did for you. And it brought healing and transformation. Let me go on. The, the idea that Isaiah 53 cannot apply to Jesus because he was not despised by the people I actually deal with in volume three of my series on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. Answer 4.11. What's the issue? Isaiah 53 first speaks of the origins of the Messiah, lowly. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? He grew up in a small town in Galilee. And then it focuses on his death, rejected, despised, hated, misunderstood. In point of fact, he was only temporarily admired by the crowds. One Christian author said as long as he was misunderstood, he was followed by the crowds. Once he came to be understood, they crucified him. That's why he died a criminal's death, forsaken by people. And that's why his name is still used as a curse word. And that's why by so many Jewish people here, he's still despised. Just like the scripture said. The idea that, that it couldn't apply to him because he opened his mouth on the cross. First, we know that it took people by surprise. The fact that over and over he didn't reply when he was asked to defend himself. He didn't reply. He's the one from which Martin Luther King and Gandhi and others got the picture of nonviolent resistance. And how are you going to say it applied to the Jewish people and not him? We never raised our voices. We've never protested. And how are you going to say that the passage applies to the Jewish people? We've never been praised. We've never been liked. We've never been prominent in the society. The arguments just don't hold water at all. So again, Isaiah 53, when read rightly, when read in context, when read without rhetoric, you look at it, you go home, you read it, it speaks of one person. I ask you again, who is this one who, according to the scriptures, had a mission to the nations as well as to the people of Israel? I've, I've had the joy of going overseas more than 100 different times, and I can, I can personally introduce you to former Hindus, former Muslims, former atheists, former terrorists, former lost people, former self-righteous people, former messed up people from every religion and walk of life who now worship the God of Israel, pray for the Jewish people, and love Israel, because of this Jesus, the Messiah, yet he was rejected by his own people, just as the text said. It speaks of his past and his present life and his future. Three tenses work perfectly well. Who is this one who came when he was supposed to come? He came at the appointed time. He died, as the scripture said. He rose from the dead. He continues on to this day, even though his own people reject him. One day the light will go on for so many of you like it went on for me. And you read it and thought, ah, I thought he was dying a criminal's death. I thought he was a Meshuma. I thought he was an apostate. I thought he was this. I, he was How oh, I realized he was dying for me. And when that revelation comes, as the prophet said, Uvachabarato, near Palano, and by his wounds and sufferings, there's healing for all of us. And there's healing for everyone here. It works. It's true. It's real. Just as the prophet said. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Now, Shmuley, 10 minutes with you, please. I apologize for being vertically challenged. <laughs> My friends, does it not strike you as somewhat curious that amid Dr. Brown's argument that Isaiah 53 is a prophecy of Jesus, 
concerning his atonement for the nation of Israel who despised and rejected him, upon whose head their sin was placed by God, and for whom they received atonement. Does it not strike you as somewhat odd that 40 years after that atonement, the Jews were inflicted with the single greatest catastrophe of their entire existence up until that time? 40 years after Jesus dies, not even. The Romans send their best generals to sweep down from the north and crush a rebellion that according to Roman historians leaves about one million Jews dead and leaves the temple in shambles. This was the Holocaust of its time. You see, the Romans didn't have gas chambers. So killing a million Jews was really hard work. You had to drive a sword into each and every one of them, pierce them with a lance, maybe crucify them the way Jesus was. Of course, Pontius Pilate crucified about 250,000 Jews before he was recalled by the Emperor Tiberius. So Jesus brings atonement for the Jews, and that's what this verse is supposed to refer to. And how does the atonement help them? Well, four decades later, they have a holocaust that kills about one out of three Jews who were alive at that time. Is that atonement? And if it is, who the heck needs it? Please keep such atonement to yourselves, we beg you. We Jews have had that kind of atonement for two millennia. We can easily live without that atonement. The example that he just gave, that, 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 that and Mike doesn't mind if I call him Mike, I'm sure. That if you kill someone accidentally and the death of the high priest atones, so that you don't have to be put to death for it, and Jesus dies for our sins, for the sins of the Jews. Remember, even according to Dr. Michael Brown, this chapter is not referring to non-Jews at all. It's referring to the Jews who afflicted Jesus. And yet they're the only ones who didn't get atonement. They turn out to be the nation upon whom God's vengeance is visited horribly, catastrophically, and with unspeakable dimensions for 2,000 years. My friends, that's a preposterous argument. We know that Isaiah 53 cannot refer to Jesus, although it can refer to Martin Luther King and Abraham Lincoln, as I said, because they died silently, and Mike asked for me, if I was going to make some points to do them early, I did it in the first speech, in the first uh, exchange, but he did not respond to it. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He also said, it is done. He certainly did not go to his death silently. But more importantly, there was a movie called The Da Vinci Code. And my Christian brothers and sisters found that film to be not just heretical, to run contrary to Christian orthodoxy. They found it to be positively blasphemous, sacrilegious. They protested the film. We did a debate on that film. Yesterday in this conference in Toronto, um, I believe his name is Shimon Jakobovici, if that's, I'm pronouncing it correctly, who did the, the movie, who did the documentary on Discovery Channel with James Cameron. The tomb of Jesus, suggested that Jesus mar mar also married Mary Magdalene, had children. I debated the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C., Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, the, the senior Catholic prelate in the United States, on CNN, international, 8 p.m. on a Friday night, good Friday before Easter. It was pre-taped, by the way. <laughs> Where he said, this is blasphemous. The suggestion that Jesus had children is not only sacrilegious, it is blasphemous. And yet, whoever we're talking about in Isaiah 53, verse 10, God desired to oppress him. I already pointed out that that goes contrary to everything that Christianity believes, that Jesus laid down his life. 
He quoted it before, Mike, that the good shepherd lays down his life. Not that God chooses to kill him, but God desired to oppress him, and he afflicted him. If his soul would acknowledge guilt, had he, not, had he simply just given in and acknowledged guilt, he would see offspring and live long days. He would see offspring? You mean suddenly the person who Mike is arguing this refers to, not only is it not sacrilegious to insinuate that Jesus could marry and have children, the prophecy positively guaranteed that he would have had kids had he not died. My friends, there was a final and very important point. And by the way, it also said he would prolong his days. And since Christian theology says that Jesus had to die to atone for sins, there was no possibility he could have prolonged his days. But most importantly, I return to my original point. Did you notice that in this entire chapter of Isaiah 53, there's no mention of atonement? There is a righteous servant who suffers for the sins of others. No one can atone for your sin, but the righteous have always suffered for the sins of others. Whether it was the Jews who were brutalized through corrupt Christian teachings, not true Christian teachings, but corrupt teachings that burned our people at the stake. Whether it was the Jews who were gassed, their little babies taken, their heads smashed against trees to save the Nazi Wehrmacht bullets. The righteous have always suffered for the sins of the wicked. That does not mean that the wicked are going to be forgiven. Indeed, the wicked here are still called wicked, even after this servant suffers. And thank God for that. No one will ever atone for what Hitler did to our people. I don't care how much they believe in Christ. I don't care how many churches they go to pray at. I don't care how many Hail Marys they say. I don't care how much scripture they can memorize. You will never be able to atone for the murder of six million Jews. You will never atone for the murder of all the Jews in the Crusades. You will never atone for the murder of all the Jews in the Inquisition. Because God is just. Because those killers have no way back. Justice Osama bin Laden, who killed 3,000 innocent New Yorkers, our brothers and sisters, has no way back. And it's the reason why every single candidate in the Democratic presidential debate and the Republican presidential debate, when asked, can we take out Osama bin Laden with a, a precision strike, they all said absolutely, and when Barack Obama wasn't sure, he corrected himself in the second debate because he plummeted in the polls. Because there is no way back. Now why didn't some of our Christian leaders stand up and say, Osama bin Laden can confess his sins, he can ask clemency from the United States, he can state his belief in Jesus, and Jesus died for his sins, and suddenly the blood of 3,000 innocent Americans is wiped away as we embrace him with love and open arms because Jesus died for his sins 2,000 years ago. There is a line that you cross. There is no coming back because God is merciful, because God is loving, because God is just and he loves the victims of horrible oppressors and no one can die to atone for what they do to the defenseless and the innocent. Just as the servant of Israel who is so eloquently spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, her oppressors must understand that you cannot slaughter God's chosen people, neither can you pressure them to abandon God's covenant because they are an eternal people who will survive every debate, who will survive every persecution, and who will survive throughout time. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Rabbi. During this last segment, remember, you're going to be filling out any uh, questions that you have and uh, be passing them to the uh, outer uh, aisles, if you don't mind. And uh, we'll be collecting them. Now we have five minutes from each uh, man. And we'll begin with uh, Michael Brown. All right, five minutes. I don't know how to say this. I, I don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but I don't get something. Everybody or a bunch of people applauded when Shmuley said, who needs an atonement like that if 40 years later we suffer so terribly? We didn't accept the atonement. We rejected the Messiah as a nation, and there are consequences. That's why Jesus wept over Jerusalem. I mean, Shmuley's been telling us about consequences. There are consequences. I mean, we, we, our temple was destroyed. The first temple was destroyed because we rejected the Torah and the prophets. Jeremiah lamented the false prophets. He said, They superficially treat the fracture of my people, saying, Shalom, shalom, ve'en shalom. Peace, peace, when there's no peace, so we suffer destruction. Yeshua said, if you had only known the time of your visitation, terrible things are going to happen to you because you reject the atonement, you reject the mercy. Boy, there are consequences. The idea that God had nothing to do with the death of Jesus because he willingly laid down his life, actually the first point that I made when we debated the issue of, of who killed Jesus was that the reason he died was because it was the will of God. One of the first verses Christians memorize is John 3.16, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. It was clearly what God destined. It, it, Peter wrote that, that he was destined to die for our sins by God before the foundation of the world. And the question about seeing offspring, interestingly, uh, in the Middle Ages, Rabbi Sa'aja Gaon referred Isaiah 53 to Jeremiah, even though Jeremiah died without marriage or children, and the Lubavitchers applied it to the Rebbe, even though he never had children, interestingly. And certainly, there were Jews that died in the Holocaust without children, and Shmuley applies this verse to them, saying they'll see seed. In fact, this expression, see seed, is only found once in the entire Hebrew Bible. Yeah, Ezra is only found one time there in Isaiah 53. What exactly does it mean? Sometimes in Isaiah, seed is used in a metaphorical sense. It could refer to spiritual offspring or descendants. Or, for example, the end of Psalm 22, Zera, just means a future generation. He has risen from the dead and has seen his seed, the people of Israel, and a spiritual people around the world. He's seen that. And, and again, I ask the question, if it says he's going to die, and yet he's going to prolong his days, Shmuley says it's an eternal people. No, I say the same one who died, as the text said, is the same one who prolongs his days. Therefore, it speaks of resurrection, plain and simple. The idea that the text doesn't mention atonement, it says that he's going to be an asham, a guilt offering. Over and over, it uses specific cultic language about bearing and carrying sins. The same words and verbs that are used in, in Leviticus and other passages in Exodus, speaking of priestly ministry, speaks of his ministry. Again, just what does the text say? And, and the idea that it doesn't teach substitutionary atonement, that it just says that, that the righteous are suffering because of what wicked people do. No, it says that by the wounds of the righteous servant, we who had been wicked are healed. And the idea that, that there's no repentance for the worst of sinners, I question that. Is it possible for a Hitler or Osama bin Laden to ever truly repent? It, it would seem not. It would seem to me also they've crossed a certain line, but look, I, I was shooting heroin at 15. I was huffing diesel gas to get high. I stole money from my parents. I, I was a wicked kid. How many lines did I cross? I have a friend in India that, that was a violent communist be, before he had a revelation of Jesus and was transformed, and now he's doing humanitarian good on a phenomenal level throughout the land. And in fact, the Talmud points to Manasseh, who in the Bible was one of the most wicked men who ever lived, that according to the scriptures filled Jerusalem with innocent blood. And yet he repented and God forgave him. And the Talmud says that's to show that even the worst of sinners can repent. Are there consequences to our sin? Of course. If you murder someone, you're going to go to jail or death penalty or life in prison without parole. And you can be forgiven all you want. You are still going to suffer consequences to your sins. You can tell the police officer you're sorry, but you're still going to get a ticket. 
But can God forgive when we turn and repent? Yes, there are consequences for sins, but I thank God. He's a forgiving God. And when there's true tshuva, which Messiah helps us to accomplish, we can be forgiven, we can be changed, we can be transformed. And that's the wonderful message of the gospel. That's the wonderful message of Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep went astray. All of us turned from our own way, and the Lord laid on him, this man, this one, this Messiah, this ideal representative of Israel, the sins of all of us. And that's the message of the gospel. It's the message of Isaiah 53. Thank you. Rabbi Boteach, any other cards, please hand them in now. I did not expect that our debate would devolve into a justification for Christian slaughter of Jewry. And I would ask my esteemed colleague, Dr. Michael Brown, a man who I have the highest respect for, to take back his comments when I said that a million Jews were slaughtered by the Romans, the brutal Romans, the evil Romans, the pagan Romans, who also slaughtered Christians who had lions eat Christians in the Colosseum. And the Emperor Nero would take tar and flax and he would cover Christians and he would light them up like Christmas trees to entertain his whim. I did not expect to hear that the slaughter of a million Jews at the time of the Second Temple was because there are consequences. They deserved it. Is that why Jesus died? Because he was sinful? He was crucified by the Romans. He was killed by the same people who killed all those Jews. Interesting that when he dies, it's because he was a victim and he was righteous, which is Mike's entire argument tonight, that Isaiah 53 speaks of an innocent man put to death by killers. But when the Jews die, the Romans are the agents of God to punish a perfidious people. Oh, how Hitler served God so, so valiantly as he took our people and turned them into lampshades and soap because there are consequences. And those 3,000 Americans who Osama bin Laden also argued suffered the consequences did they deserve their fate too? How horrible to imply that people killed in cold blood sinned and therefore deserved their fate. That, my friends, is blasphemy. That, my friends, <laughs> is sacrilege. There was a man, and perhaps I misunderstood, sitting next to another man with a yellow shirt. You're wearing a blue shirt. If I heard you correctly, as Mike was speaking, you yelled out, the Jews deserved it. Is that correct? I'm sorry. Thank you. I was about to give up hope on us all. Thank you very much. And then Mike argues that... Atonement is mentioned in the chapter for the word Asham, although here Asham means simply guilty. If this 
man who died would have acknowledged guilt, he wouldn't have died, but he didn't. He was prepared to die for his convictions, like Natan Sharansky, who could easily have avoided 13 years in the Russian gulag had he signed a paper saying he was guilty of espionage for the CIA, but he refused. But you know what's the most curious thing of all? That Mike just said that the only reason we Jews didn't get the atonement of Jesus dying on the cross is because we didn't believe in him. There's no mention whatsoever in the chapter that whoever we are discussing in this chapter, that we need repose faith in this person at all. As we would say in yeshiva, ikar chaser minasefer, his, the entire thrust of his argument that it's not the belief in Jesus that atones. So this certainly can't refer to Christ. It's the belief in Jesus that atones. It's not the death. The suffering and death of Jesus is insufficient. You just heard him say it. He can die a million times, but unless you believe in him, you are going to the eternal barbecue in heaven, which Mike still believes that we Jews are going to, even though I know he loves me. Maybe he thinks I need a good tan. And yet the, this chapter says that whoever we're speaking about just simply accepted the iniquity of the wicked and it made no difference that no one believed in them. Astonishing. The single most important chapter cited by Christian missionaries to convert Jews doesn't mention a word about ever believing in this servant. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Appreciate your comments so much. We have a number of questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, I'm sure. And so we're trying to select some of the more controversial ones, perhaps. Uh, I've deciphered Ugaritic and Ethiopian Coptic, but uh, never have I seen some of this writing before. Uh, Mike Brown will follow, uh, will follow the same order, and so Steve Fincher will be asking the questions for Mike Brown. Yeah, we've got a lot of questions here and about a half an hour, so we'll get right to it. This one, the first one is for uh, Dr. Brown. Just what exactly did Jesus' death accomplish as a Messiah? Is the world any better today where hatred and killing are so prevalent? That's a, a great question. I, um, just real quick, I, I want to point out verse 1, Shmuley, of the chapter, Mi Hamin Lishmuatenu, who has believed our report. The chapter starts with a question about who has believed it. And, and just one other thing, when you clap about there's never Jewish guilt, let's forget everything the last 2,000 years. According to the Torah, according to the Torah, if we sin against God, we'll be punished. And why was the first temple destroyed? Because of our sins. I could see you clapping if someone in the house said, how could you say we died because of our sins? Because it says that that's what happened. Did I make any reference to 9-11? Did I make any reference to the Holocaust? Of course not. But it always has to get raised to draw our attention away from what's written in the text. Okay, as to the specific question, is, has the world changed through, through the coming of Jesus into the world? On the one hand, of, of course, there's been a massive turning away from, from idolatry by hundreds of millions of people worldwide. And the knowledge of God has gone to the farthest corners of the world. That's absolutely happened. And, and the scriptures have gone around the world through the coming of Messiah. Where there's been a, a misunderstanding among the Jewish people is that we have failed to see he was going to do a priestly work and a royal work. The priestly work was to suffer and die and make atonement and when added with faith, we are changed. And by the way, the Hebrew word asham does not mean guilty. That's ashem. Asham means a guilt offering, period. You'll find that in virtually every Jewish translation. But, but the point is, Messiah's mission was first to come as a sacrificial lamb, first to die, to open the way for all people, not just Jews, to God. How do you think these people and all the other nations, the idol worshippers and the pagans, how are they going to find out about the God of Israel? Is it just a Jewish message? Or does the rest of the world get to hear the good news? 
So he comes to make this available for all people. He says, even though you all fall short, even though you all sin, I offer you mercy as you turn back to me. And then as the knowledge of God continues to go through the earth and we cooperate with the messianic mission, then he will return and establish his kingdom in Jerusalem. So what Jews are waiting for traditionally as the first act is actually the second act. And we know the second act will happen because the first already did. We know the rest will come because we already have the down payment and the deposit. Thanks. It's an excellent question. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> I failed to mention that there is a one-minute opportunity to respond if you'd like to respond to that uh, answer, Rabbi. Put there. Any cursory review of Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1, mi hamin if you know the most basic Sunday school Hebrew grammar. The, uh, the Hamin, who would have believed, refers to the Shmua Seinu, what we have heard about this servant. There is not a single insinuation whatsoever that one need to believe in the servant. It's the Shmua Seinu. To, what, to the story you're about to hear, Mihamin, the Shmua Seinu, suddenly believes you have to believe in human sacrifice? You have to suddenly believe in the utter abrogation of all that Judaism detests and abhors like the story of Molech where Jewish parents, ancient Israelites used to bring their children and sacrifice them to this God Molech by passing them through fire and God calls it an abomination. Human sacrifice is all that Judaism came into the world to abhor, to detest, to condemn, and to denounce. No man needs to die for some wicked person who is a killer. It is the killer themselves who unfortunately has to die. Thank you. You can stay standing. Stay standing because there's a question for you. This is uh, to Rabbi Shmuley Boteak. What do you think about the Jewish movement that wants to rebuild the temple and reinstitute animal sacrifice. Should this come to pass? If so, why should there be such a thing if human effort and responsibility as opposed to atonement are important doc, doc, distinctives of the Jewish gift of the world? In many of our debates, I have pointed out that the quintessential biblical story of atonement is the story of Jonah, who is sent to deliver a message to the city of Nineveh, one of the great metropolises of the ancient world, that they have become so wicked that the entire city will be nehefaches, will be turned over and destroyed like Sodom and Gomorrah. And Jonah delivers his message ultimately, and the city of Nineveh repents. And the king of Nineveh gets off his mighty throne and he dons sackcloth and ashes and he humbles himself. And without a single drop of blood being mentioned or being spilled, not one sacrifice, not one goat, not one pigeon, and certainly not one human, the entire city is granted clemency and they find favor before God. We do not need animal sacrifice for atonement, and that is the greatest proof. It is true that God says that animal sacrifice is a reach nichoach la Hashem. It is a sweet, savory offering to God. And as such, because it is our desire as a nation to please God, we pray every single day, several times a day, for the restoration of the animal sacrifices and indeed the rebuilding of the temple. And as an orthodox traditional Jew, I say those prayers passionately and fervently. But not because I need blood to atone for my sins, but because I wish once again to see God in all his glory in the great temple in Jerusalem. First, in case anyone actually believed that Christians uh, believe in human sacrifice, God forbid. 
I believe in Isaiah 53 that the suffering of the just and righteous one brings atonement and healing and forgiveness. In the same traditions that we quoted, all these Jewish sources about the atoning power of the death of the righteous. But actually the, the, the sacrifices were more than just a reach nichoach, a sweet smelling savor. It says in Leviticus 17.11 that, that God has given them on the altar lichaper al nashotechem to make atonement for your sins. Blood was the central means of atonement in the ancient Israelite system. And there are rabbinic traditions that say that, that the power of the blood on the altar was that God remembered the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22 as if he had actually died. In fact, he didn't die. But there was something that God was looking to, and that was ultimately the blood of the Messiah. As, as for the Ninevites, in point of fact, there's a rabbinic tradition that also says that as the temple was being destroyed, some of the Jews said to the Romans, now who's going to make atonement for you that you're destroying our temple? In other words, Israel was a priestly nation. Israel offered the sacrifices for the nations. The Ninevites didn't have to offer sacrifices. All they needed to do was repent. Thank you. This question is from Mike Brown. As Jews, we worship one God who created the universe. Christians worship Jesus as they believe he is not only the Son of God, but is truly divine and part of the Trinity. Why did Jesus then in his lifetime and on the cross worship God if he himself was God? That's a, another terrific question. In fact, uh, Shmuley and I are hoping to, to do a debate just on that subject at Oxford University, so God willing, we'll do that one of these days in the future. Uh, in volume two of my series on answering Jewish objections to Jesus, answers 3.1 through 3.4, I spend 70,000 words answering that question in depth because it's a serious question. Uh, in short, uh, we worship one God. All those who recognize Jesus as Messiah worship one God and one God only. And monotheism has spread throughout the world more through Jesus than through any other Jew, any other source. But God's unity is complex according to the scriptures. We have uh, verses that say no one can see God and live and other verses that say that people saw God. Uh, we have verses like Deuteronomy 4 that says you saw no form when you saw God and Numbers 12 that says that Moses saw the form of the Lord. How is it explained? John 1.18 in the New Testament says this, no one has seen God at any time. 1 Timothy 6 speaks of God the Father who dwells in unapproachable light. No one can see him or has ever seen him. And yet it says Yeshua makes him known. What's the mystery? The mystery is this. God is complex in his unity. There are various teachings in, in, in mystical Jewish writings. There, there are teachings of, of, of how God, the infinite, eternal, transcendent God, touches man. We understand that God is complex in his unity, existing as three in one. There are other rabbinic concepts that certainly do not teach that, but teach related means of how the infinite, eternal God touches us. So God the Son makes himself known on this earth, drawing all attention to the Heavenly Father, drawing all attention to the one true God. In that sense, Jesus serves as a magnet of worship and devotion that as people look to him, all praise, honor, and glory goes to the one true God. There's also a mystery, and I'm not going to answer this in a minute because this is a major question about the nature of the eternal God, and that's why I spilled 70,000 words discussing it because it's an excellent, important question. But the fact is, through Yeshua, God comes down and touches the human race, and that's why Jesus the man points all attention to God his Father. It's a simple answer to a complex question. If you'll study it out more, you'll see I can actually prove this from the Hebrew Scriptures alone. Would you care to respond? My friends, Christianity is a great world religion. And some of the finest citizens of this great nation are devout and believing Christians who were raised to live lives of selflessness and lives of service. But there can be no doubt that the Christian emphasis on the deity of Jesus directly contradicts the most central teachings of the Bible, which states clearly, as Moses said to the Israelite nation as they stood at Mount Sinai, you saw no form, you saw no image. Indeed, the second commandment is an absolute categoric prohibition of creating any image. 
Indeed, I know Mike Brown agrees with that, which is one of the main reasons that Protestantism broke off from Catholicism, because they objected to the icons which were seen as idolatrous. God is not a man, as the prophet Samuel says. Kilo Adamu. It behooves our Christian brothers and sisters, not God forbid, to abandon their Christianity, which would have catastrophic consequences for the world. If Christianity is weakened, the state of Israel is weakened. If Christianity is weakened, then tens of thousands of devout missionaries who feed orphans and treat lepers will be abandoned. It rather behooves our Christian brothers and sisters to re-examine their Christian faith in light of traditional Judaism, which is how Jesus himself practiced Judaism. Jesus said that he was the son of man, and it's capitalized in the New Testament. But that M ben Adam is a common expression for all humanity, and it is what the prophet Ezekiel calls himself constantly. As far as Jesus even referring to himself at times as being almost one with the Father, or the Son of God, we're all the children of God. It's in the Bible. Bani matem la shem You are all children of the Lord your God. As far as Jesus speaking the name of the Father, Moses does the exact same thing. It was a common practice among Jewish prophets. We say the Shema every single day. Moses says, V'nasati metar artzachem b'ito. I will give rain. Moses will give rain. And the Talmud says, Shechina medaberas b'toch grona. Moses was a great prophet. God spoke through his larynx. Jesus was a devout Jew. He would have absolutely denied the deification of his person because for him as well, it would have been blasphemous. Thank you very much, Rabbi. I wish we had more time for questions. We simply do not. Uh, I'll be, be sure to hand these questions to Rabbi Boteach, and uh, Dr. Brown will receive the questions that you've written for him as well. If you want a personal response, I'm sure you can get one if you speak to one of them after the uh, meeting tonight. We're going to end with a two-minute summary from each one of the speakers, and then there will be a couple of announcements from uh, Steve Finchel, and then we will be dismissed. So two minutes each, if you don't mind. Mike, please. Shmuley actually got uh, an extra minute at the end there, but I, I like so much of what you were saying that I was, I was agreeing with so much of it. I, I, I want to say something honestly, uh, which I don't know if I've ever said publicly, but sometimes before I've had a debate with Shmuley, and sometimes after the debate, I felt personally conflicted. Why? Because I really love him as a person. I really care for him as a fellow Jew. I honor him. I hear he's debating Richard Dawkins. I'm cheering for him. We have so much in common, and yet I cannot deny the truth. And I would rather go for the personal conflict of having to stand up and publicly differ and publicly point out what I believe are clear errors in interpretation and, and, and clear attempts to just get people to react rather than just look at the text. I, I would rather get up for the sake of truth, and thankfully our friendship has only gotten deeper through the years because of it. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. Every point I made still stands. Go back to the points as soon as the DVD is available or the webcast. Go back to it. Go home and read the scriptures again and study and think. The reason that I've written everything I've written, the reason I, I got a PhD in Near Eastern languages, and the, the reason that I dialogue with, with counter-missionaries here that I, I consider dear friends, save them seats hopefully so that they can come and they challenge me all the time is because I continue to study. My life has been radically changed, but any objection that's raised, I'm going to look at head on. I'll say this and I'm done. Many years ago after talking to some ultra-Orthodox rabbis in Brooklyn, I went home and got on my face and prayed and said, God, if believing in Jesus is wrong, no matter what kind of a fool I look like, I would turn away from the faith in a moment and deny him and take it on the chin. But if what I believe is right and true and Yeshua is our Messiah, and he doesn't abrogate Judaism, God forbid, he doesn't abrogate the true faith, according to Scripture, if, if he's the true and real Messiah, then no matter what it costs, I don't care if I'm rejected, hated, mocked, slandered, or threatened with death, I will follow him. I wonder if you have ever really prayed and said, God, is what I believe right? Are the traditions I was raised in, whatever traditions they were, are they right? I challenge you to do what Scripture says 
and to do what it says in Isaiah 55, Dear Shuat Adonai Behimat So, seek the Lord while he may be found. A door of opportunity is open for us while we have life and breath. Seek, ask hard questions, go to God, study, and I believe you'll come to the same conclusions I have. Isaiah 53 speaks of our Messiah who suffered and died and rose from the dead. Thanks so much for coming. Yes, sir. Rabbi. My friends, two nights ago was the 13th anniversary of the passing of the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the inspiration of my life, a man who embodied in his person a degree of love for the stranger and for his people that was unsurpassed. And Mike is right that even in the case of the great Rebbe, there have been those who in his death would like to say he was more than a man but he inspired me because he was a man. You see, if he was more than a man, then how could he possibly touch my life? He wouldn't know what I struggle with. He wouldn't know what I wrestle with. He wouldn't know my challenges. And I could dismiss him because he's superhuman. But because he was a man, he could touch my life because he was there with me in the trenches and he emerged victorious and he lived a godly life and he beckons me till today he, his message haunts me to follow suit and lead a godly life and because he was a man I have no excuse what would Jesus do if he's God does it matter? We know he would do the right thing. He's perfect. He could never understand the trials and tribulations of being human, of having to say you're sorry when you don't want to swallow your pride, of having to give charity when you work so hard for that money, of having to inspire your kids when you'd rather come home and just veg in front of the TV. A human Jesus who led a godly life, which is absolutely what he did with beautiful godly teachings is the true inspiration not someone who died and said you now no longer have to do the hard work because I've done it for you it's the Jesus who struggled against the might of Rome and died for his people who truly inspires us my friends let us go forth not just to have shalom in the home I promise to plug <laughs> but shalom in the world let us never, ever trivialize the suffering of the righteous by saying that there are consequences. Let us always blame the aggressor and never the victim. Let us find a common path to God even as we approach him through different roads. Let us truly create a bastion of peace on earth illuminated by the faithful who show those who are not yet in faith that when we walk with God, while we may not always agree, we never walk alone. Thank you very much.